we have been talking about fleeting samadhis in chapter 17 of the Tripurarasya. Fleeting samadhis are those which just happen spontaneously without any real effort. This does not mean that the effort has not taken place in a previous lifetime. Most likely that has happened or the person has evolved through many, many lifetimes and has now reached that point where such beautiful insights come spontaneously. He talked about the moments in our lives these experiences that are very similar to samadhi, these are called fleeting samadhis and some of the examples given in the beginning of this chapter were when one is in a very intense and deep embrace of the lover, you experience this moment of complete presence, being in the now. You're not aware of anything else other than that moment. And that is similar to the state of samadhi. So it's a fleeting samadhi. There may be other moments, for example, of intense fear. The example given in the Tripura Rasa is you're walking along cheerfully and suddenly there's a tiger springs in front of you. And that too is an example of a fleeting samadhi because in that moment you are absolutely 100% present. You have no other way out. Some other ex examples may be, for example, when you experience deep pain, very intense pain, then too, your mind is pulled right into that moment. You cannot escape because intense pain makes it very difficult for your thoughts to wander, for the mind to wander. The pain pulls you back to that moment again and again. And you may try to distract yourself, but you cannot. The pain is too powerful. And that is also this moment of simply being there in the now, in that space. So there are many such events or moments in our life that we may experience such fleeting samadhis. However, we are ignorant and are unable to recognize this most of the times. So the Tripura Rasya says that the ignorant for the lack of knowledge are not aware that there's a treasure that they have been given and they just throw it away, like throwing away a jewel or a gem. So that is really the kind of example given that this is such a treasure, but for the lack of knowledge, we do not recognize this. It may also be that this moment of samadhi is very mild, is very brief, and so you don't really catch it. The buddhi, the intellect, is not sharp enough to catch that moment and to recognize it. So you need to train your body, sharpen your body. If that moment is very intense or if that moment is prolonged, the samadhi is prolonged longer period of time, then it has really the power to transform you. And when that happens, of course, you begin to ask questions. What is this? What happened to me? And then the desire to grow Ha occurs, the desire to know what happened and how it happened grows. So, even if samadhi does happen to some of us, this is of no value if you do not know what happened, if you're not able to recognize it, and if you're not able to expand on it and work with it, that samadhi is lost, washed away. 
So these are fleeting samadhis and many of us have experienced these, some briefly, some more intensely and some have been changed and transformed and some have not. They have become perhaps a little bit more curious but this has not had a lasting change. But for most people, they remain ignorant because they do not recognize the value of this samadhi. So the Tripura Rahasya goes on to explain the forms of samadhi. The first step of samadhi is called Savikalp Samadhi. And that Savikalp Samadhi is able to destroy ignorance for the betterment of the world. So, when sincere efforts to know the truth are made in many lifetimes, the pure self blesses the seeker from within and then he is inspired to attain liberation. Otherwise, for millions of years, such an opportunity does not arise. To comment here on these verses 50-51, chapter 17 of Tripura Asya, we see and learn that the experience of a person who is motivated to start questioning and has this desire to know the truth comes from efforts of many lifetimes and when that happens he is inspired to attain liberation. If this does not happen over many lifetimes such an opportunity may not arise even for millions of years or many many lifetimes. So you can imagine that it is a rare privilege for those who experience such samadhis and also a privilege for those who question or inquire and want to know what this is, even though they may not have experienced it themselves. But the seeking has started. And when these sincere efforts are repeated through many lifetimes, the pure self blesses the seeker from within. Verse 52, to be born in the world endowed with intelligence is very difficult and to have a one-pointed inward mind is the most difficult of all. O Brahmin, the non-sentient and sentient exist in the world. Human beings also exist. Among human beings, millions live like animals and have no knowledge of truth, untruth, sin and virtue. Millions of people motivated by worldly desire are engaged in the world and caught in its charms and temptations. The learned ones, proud of their learning, have a desire for heavenly joys. A fortunate few who are endowed with the faculty of discrimination still do not know how to purify their minds and hearts. Therefore, they deprive themselves of the attainment of the highest state. So the verses 52 to 57 say it is a great privilege to be born with intelligence, to be endowed with intelligence of any kind is a privilege. But to have a one-pointed mind and a mind that naturally turns inward is even more difficult. So if you should have this gift, consider it really to be grace and do not throw away this opportunity. It may not come back for a long, long time. Because most human beings live like animals. Millions of them live like animals and they are not able to differentiate between the truth and untruth. 
they are not able to differentiate between sin and virtue. They do not have this ability. And you may wonder, how is it? How can you not know the difference between the true two? But isn't it true that many of us do certain things knowing well that it is not really right? It could be something like evading taxes, telling a lie for something which you really want to have. These things are normal for most of us. We all go through life. Uh, there are difficult moments and sometimes in these moments you may do such things. Some of us do it with awareness, but most of us do this unconsciously. They, they do not really think much about it. People are caught up in their worldly desires, in the charms and temptations. And even those who are learned become proud of their learning. So these are many obstacles. First obstacle, it's so really difficult to be born with some intelligence. Even more difficult to have a one-pointed mind. There are people getting caught up in the world with its charms and temptations. So all these are various obstacles. Hurdles. And those who are fortunate, they have difficulties too. So let us find out what difficulties they have in verse 57. A fortunate few who are endowed with the faculty of discrimination still do not know how to purify their minds and hearts. Therefore, they deprive themselves of the attainment of the highest state. That highest state of consciousness is veiled by Maya. How can those who are blinded by Maya attain moksha? That is why such ignorant ones can never attain samadhi, the highest state. There are a, fortune, a few unfortunate ones who, though they understand the importance of liberation, get so caught up in the whirlpool of their emotions that they lose that opportunity, like one who, possessing a gem, throws it away without knowing its worth. Oh, how powerful is the veil of Maya, that some even have the ability to attain samadhi but are lost in the jungle of their thinking and lose the gem from their hands. So the verses 58 onwards, we talk about 57 onwards, we talk about those who are fortunate enough to have had an experience of discriminative wisdom but they do not know how to purify their minds. So they've had its insight, they had a flash, and they know they need to do something, but they do not know what to do and how to do it. And if they do not seek, and they do not keep putting in effort to find out the way or through a teacher, they deprive themselves of this attainment. So even though they had the opportunity they throw away this opportunity. The power of Maya is so strong that only a few very rare ones will cut through that veil. So it says there are some who are even more unfortunate because they have even understood the value and the importance of liberation. But then they are caught up in their emotions. So they may even have found a teacher or a system, but they are still caught up in their emotions. So these people, they are in a sense even more unfortunate because they see this. They, they have this jewel in them, they know it, but they are so caught up that they cannot continue. 
they lose it, they lose that moment. It's just like throwing away a gem. Can you imagine you would one day, just by chance, walking, you find a gem lying on the street, wonderful diamond, beautiful, big, perfect. And you don't know the value of this, you throw it away. But wouldn't it be even more foolish if you knew the value of this and you still threw it away? So you understand the difference between the first and the second. Those who experience a fleeting samadhi but do not recognize it maybe because it's the first time it happened or it was too mild and they, they just ignore that. It's unfortunate. But even more so is one who recognizes it. He knows it. He has had it before, maybe many times. And he has found a system, he may have found a teacher, but he still does not practice, he's still not systematic, he still not organizes his life. How unfortunate is that? So that's example given. Such a one has found the gem, recognized the gem and still thrown it away. Verse 61 those fortunate ones by whose devotion the self is pleased are free from the bondage of maya and gifted with scriptural knowledge and faith. Such rare ones attain the highest state of enlightenment, endowed with non-attachment, burning desire to attain Atman, immense faith, the seeker seeks the refuge of an adept, and by receiving knowledge of liberation, attains freedom. This knowledge is direct knowledge. Only one self-existent reality is subject to contemplation. By right logic, one should come to understanding and dispel all doubts. In this way, with full determination and firm faith, one should continue contemplating on Atman until he has realized it. One should make full effort. So these verses tell us that then there are the rare ones who do attain enlightenment. These are really rare beings. And how are they attaining enlightenment? They attain enlightenment because they have non-attachment, which is the Vaivagya. They have a burning desire to attain this. And they have faith. So, three things. And such a one, he will seek out a teacher, an edict, one who has experienced this before, who is able to guide. And such a one will help the seeker to receive the knowledge of liberation and gain freedom. Are there any thoughts or comments? So, Haas, would you like to say something? Okay, thank you for muting. <clears throat> so, having described all the possible hurdles and obstacles such as not recognizing samadhi when it happens to you. Happens, but still you just ignore it. Or the person who does recognize it and endow it with all the right skills, such as non-attachment, burning desire and faith, he attains. And this knowledge is direct knowledge. And through contemplation and right logic, one dispels all doubts. Once you have had direct experience, there will be no doubts. Faith is an interesting word. 
because most of the time our faith is based on other people's experience. So we hear from scriptures, we read from scriptures or books, and so we develop a faith because we believe these scriptures, we trust them. Or you may have a teacher, and the teacher has explained something and has experienced something and narrated it. And so you trust your teacher. And so, once again, that's second-hand knowledge. It's not direct knowledge. And you have based it on trust. So it's a belief. But what happens when you've experienced something directly? There's no need for belief. It simply is a fact, and you know it. Someone can try to convince you as much as he can and says to you, there is no sun. And you look at the sky and you know there's light around you and that's because of the sun and he keeps insisting there's no sun. You're not going to believe it. So, you have the direct knowledge and nothing will convince you otherwise because you know it to be true. So, verse 67 says, In this way, with full determination and firm faith, one should continue contemplating on Atman until he has realized it. One should make full effort. I am the pure self. One who contemplates with this single desire through meditation attains the highest state and dispels the darkness of ignorance. Do not doubt it. A very nice and interesting verse, verse 68. I am the pure self. If you contemplate on this, single-mindedly, one-pointed mind, with a very strong desire, you will attain. This verse can also be misunderstood. I know of people who keep repeating, I am pure self, I am pure self, and they keep shouting it loud. Well, the only thing you're going to get from that is maybe a sore throat. When we talk about contemplation here, we are not just talking about loud repetition, but deeper and intense desire which comes from within perhaps through a little bit of direct experience and then there's no doubt about it and this becomes stronger and stronger with time just imagine the example which was given in the beginning of this chapter you're walking cheerfully along the road and suddenly a tiger jumps in front of you. What happens to your mind? Are you thinking about what you're going to shop for from the supermarket tomorrow? When the tiger is standing in front of you, you will only see the tiger. Your mind is simply caught there. Your awareness, your attention, everything is focused on the tiger. Can you think about your loved ones? Probably not, because in that moment, all you're looking at and thinking about is the tiger. There seems to be nothing else. This is what is meant by contemplation with a single desire. If you can do that, that you forget everything else. You will just have pure self in front of you. And then that happens. Because everything else subsides. Coming back to the tiger example. When this tiger springs up in front of you, you don't have to make an effort to concentrate on the tiger. Your mind simply goes there. It cannot go anywhere else other than focus on the tiger. And if that's the case, in a sense you can say that there is no effort required to focus on the tiger. 
And so it should be when you're talking about I am pure self, I am Shuddha Atman, then you don't need to put effort to think I am Shuddha Atman, I am Atman, I am pure self. It just goes there. There is no other way or no other place it will go. This is also called Dhriti in the Bhagavad Gita. When the mind is very preoccupied with something, it can also be in a tamasic sense, in a negative sense, like fear, exactly used in this example of the tiger. It can also be in terms of our insecurities, you know, if we have certain problems in life, we feel insecure. If you are... For example, you might lose your job. Then your mind becomes totally preoccupied with that. You can't think of anything else. And that is a more negative form of concentration. But that's exactly the process used. The process is the same. Any thoughts or questions so far? Did some of you try to think about the example of the tiger? Imagine yourself front of a tiger or it could be a snake something dangerous it could be even something like um, an aggressive dog and you think about it um, you forget everything else you are in front of an aggressive dog and he's just about to come bite your leg <laughs> then your mind is totally occupied with that dog and you're not going to think of anything else other than that Verse 69. Now we are moving to the next aspect. Cervicalp was what we talked about. Cervicalp samadhi is when you have an object of concentration. So here we took the example of something a little bit more negative such as a tiger in front of you. And your mind was focused onto one object. And now we move on to nirvikalp samadhi. Nir means without, so without thought. So there's no object and it's a state, it's a more diffused state, let me put it this way. Seedless samadhi also called. Verse 69. Nirvikalp samadhi is attained through the deep state of meditation then one constantly remembers on that. He should maintain that awareness with every breath of his life. I am the self-existent absolute one. Such a determination will help one to receive the knowledge that destroys the very root of ignorance and its offshoots. In the highest state of meditation, the mind does not reason or desire. There are various avenues of knowledge but the highest state of knowledge is all-pervading pure consciousness. By not experiencing anything other than Atman, all thoughts are removed. Once they are removed, the highest state of Samadhi is attained. At this disappearance of the picture, the background remains crystal clear. Therefore, completely removing the picture causes clarity. So what has happened now? In Nirvikarp Samadhi, even the object seems to recede and the pure self shines forth. Such an experience will destroy the very root of ignorance. There's no reasoning, no logical reasoning left, no desire left. All that is there is pure consciousness. 
And this is the highest state of samadhi, nirvikalp samadhi. In the earlier chapter, the text talks about a mirror. So we say that if you are looking in the mirror, there are objects, then these objects are reflected. But if there is no object, what is there? That's just the mirror. It's difficult to imagine now <laughs> a mirror without any object, a mirror that doesn't seem to reflect anything. But that is paradoxical, but that's how pure consciousness is. Pure consciousness reflects, and its reflection is the world. But when we are able to go into that space where there are no objects, instantly pure consciousness itself shines forth. It's like a mirror without any objects reflected in it. We focus then only on the mirror itself. If the mirror example is a little bit confusing, since we can't imagine a mirror that has no reflection of any kind, then just think about a blackboard. On the blackboard you write with chalk and all sorts of things appear on the blackboard. You can draw and you know make figures. And so all of life appears on this kind of blackboard on a surface called consciousness and it plays itself out there. But when you rub away everything from the blackboard, there's nothing but just the blackboard, then you have pure consciousness. When something is written on the blackboard, you don't notice the blackboard. You notice the writing on the board. That's where your mind goes. That's what we see. And so you may read the writing on the board and it may say me. It may say my son, my partner, my parents. And these are these attachments, my house, my car. And right, wipe away everything, all the mice, the ego, and everything is gone. And suddenly you, you, you don't see my house and my, my partner and my car, what you see is purely the blackboard. And that is pure consciousness. So when these pictures on the blackboard disappears, the background itself appears. So removing the picture itself causes clarity. And so how can we do that? Through purifying the mind. So when the mind is free of desire, when the mind is free of all these various objects that are floating there, you see the background. The background in which all this plays out is pure consciousness. Similarly, when free from desire, the mind becomes liberated. Therefore, renunciation of the seeds of all desires leads to the attainment of the self. So when we experience a state of desirelessness, the mind has the opportunity to be liberated. There's a certain calm. In the examples given just before, the beginning of this chapter, one of the examples was about an intense desire being fulfilled. Imagine any intense desire that you had. Maybe you had a desire to find a partner or get married. And when this was fulfilled, there was a sudden contentment which maybe lasted for a longer period of time and you felt just happy. For those who wanted to have children, that desire came true. There was a sense of contentment. Or it could be something simpler, like an intense desire to, to get a job or to get a promotion in the job. And then suddenly you feel just content. Now imagine that all these little desires are fulfilled. What happens to the mind? The mind rests. And when the mind is quiet and resting, 
the pure consciousness shines forth. And these desires are like seeds which are germinate, do not germinate anymore, they're roasted. So these don't re-emerge. That only, of course, happens if we have a high degree of awareness and we are aware of these seeds of desire within us. Any questions about this, about the seeds of desire, the process of meditation? So has how to overcome and control ego which proves its existence time to time. <clears throat> well, there are two parts of your questions, how to work, overcome ego and the other is how to control ego. Control may not necessarily be the right word. We cannot really control our mind or our egos in that sense. We try to do so. It's the ego that's controlling the mind itself, right? So <laughs> to control the ego itself is a little bit difficult. But what you mean is how we can polish our ego. We can polish the ego a little bit, the sense of identity, so that we are not too obnoxious <laughs> and that we don't create too many difficulties and obstacles for ourselves. So you can polish your ego by doing simple things, you know, organizing your life in a simple way. If you know what you want from your life, proceed in a manner that is really simple, straightforward, and do less, but focus on what you really want. You don't have to do everything. Just because your friends are doing it, or your parents said so, or you know, all the different reasons that people give. You don't have to do everything. You just need to figure out what you want from your life and then do that. And polish your ego or organize your life in such a way so that you learn to live with the people around you, family as well as at work or at in different departments of our life without creating more obstacles. So that was about polishing the ego. Once the ego is polished, you can think about overcoming it. But that's the more difficult part and that's the part which requires deep meditation. And to learn deep meditation, you have to be part of a meditative tradition like ours where you would then be given instructions and guidance and learn a systematic process of meditation to go deep within, to remove conflicts, to acquire a one-pointed mind and go through the different stages and levels of samadhi till you have attained. So it's not a simple process as we have been discussing here already. You see that there are many obstacles as well. You may get insights but you don't have a system. You may get insights but you don't have a good teacher. You may want to do it. You have done it. You have, <laughs> you have a teacher. You have a good practice but then your emotions come and they are very strong and very powerful and they take you away so you have to keep putting effort and don't give up some kalp shakti is required so if you do not already have a teacher and if you have a sincere and deep desire you should get um, guidance Ok, 
okay um <laughs> you're most welcome suhas i'm glad that that was useful for you we come to verse 75 and we come now to those who have purified their buddhi so buddhi is that part within us that's most sattvic that's closest to our atman or the self so it is not the self it is not the atman but it is the closest in its nature to atman and the verse says those who have purified their buddhi can realize the self in a moment's time o brahman there are three types of seekers so first a short note here purifying buddhi what does it mean to purify buddhi we just said that buddhi is the closest thing to atman it's the most sattvic part in reality you don't really have to purify buddhi what you have to purify is your mind in practical terms all you have to do is clear the mind which means manas must learn to be more disciplined and follow the instructions of buddhi it means that the ego should be more polished refined and also a little bit more disciplined and obedient obedient in the sense it listens to what buddhi says and then chitta which is our memory bank full of emotions and memories needs to be purified so that we are more aware self aware and that these deep emotions and memories do not disturb us when these three are purified then buddhi will shine through it's like a muddy pool you know it's all murky and muddy you can't see through the bottom but you can see through the bottom if the water is placid it's calm and the mud will settle down to the bottom and then you can see it's become very clear and so it is with buddhi buddhi becomes sharper when it can see through that foggy mind and you can see through that only when the mind is no longer foggy it begins to become uncolored there is not all that much of um coloring in terms of emotions memories and uh, habit patterns so if you have such a sharp buddhi a purified mind you can realize in a moment's time so now we talk about the three types of seekers so we talk about the finest of seekers now the finest seekers grasp it at once and while hearing about self realization their contemplation becomes spontaneous the f- this first category of seekers does not find any difficulty so the legend goes that king janak was of this category the finest of seekers that he was sitting in his garden he was a great king he had beautiful gardens the royal gardens and he was sitting there he used to encourage a lot of learned people to come there have discussions so while he was sitting in his gardens he heard a, a group of learned people discussing atman and as they were discussing this states of samadhi he very spontaneously in a moment attained samadhi and this king janak is great example of the royal sage this story is from the yoga vashishta so this was the first category of seekers so there is a story here about that as well long ago on a moonlit summer night i was sitting in my in a green garden 
on a costly, well-decorated seat. My beloved was embracing me, and my eyes were drowsy with wine. During that time, I heard sweet words coming down from heaven. Those words were full of praise of one absolute without a second. The same moment I realized the highest state. Then and there, through my introspective power, I attained that auspicious state and remained in that blissful ocean. After being aware of the conscious state of my mind, I started thinking that state was wonderful, wondrous and full of overwhelming bliss. Today I have attained that state beyond. Now I maintain it. The pleasures of the senses are use, valueless in comparison with that blissful state. Even the pleasures available in Brahma Loka, the heavenly kingdom of the Creator, cannot be compared to this. Up until now, I have been wasting my time like a person who does not realize his coffers are filled with treasures and wonders begging. Alas, people are unaware of the blissful joy of Atman. They make great effort to gratify their senses and do not experience the everlasting bliss that resides within. I do not need to make an effort to gain worldly pleasures. I always remain in a blissful state. What have I to do with external activities in life? It is like crushing and using the same spices again and again until they no longer have any flavor. Every day I find the same dishes of food, the same kinds of garlands, the court, valuable ornaments and damsels. Even while enjoying these objects, I find their beauty fading. Some people use them as sheep follow other sheep. This is constantly going on and now I hate these objects. Having made this decision and I wanted to go into meditation, another auspicious thought dawned. I started thinking, oh, what has happened to me? I am that self which is full of bliss. I am that. Then what more do I want? What else do I have to achieve? What have I not already achieved? What is unobtainable? Can we ever attain that which is not attained? My essential nature is everlasting bliss. How can I be engaged in actions? Body, senses and internal organs are as unreal as dreams. I am the indivisible consciousness. All things belong to me. What great experience can be attained just by controlling one of these inner instruments? This way, if I control one mind, what good is that? Now I am aware that I have many controlled and uncontrolled minds in me. If I have perfect control of all minds, and not my own mind, how will it help me? I am limitless sky. How is it possible for me to control the limitless? In this way, I am complete unto myself. Why do I need samadhi? I am full of bliss and more omniscient than the sky. Innumerable bodies and souls live by my grace. How am I concerned with any action and what have I to do with it? Therefore, I have no duty, neither am I doer nor non-doer. I am full of bliss. What will I gain from the control of my inner states? Whether I am in samadhi or not, I am truth and I am omnipresent. The state in which my body is, let it be in that state. I remain in full bliss unto myself. I am fully illuminated, perfect and pure. So we see from this that King Janaka experienced this 
as he was talking about this summer night and being in his garden. This story, of course, is, uh, as he explains, he was with his beloved and he had a bit of wine. And in that moment, this happened to him, this experience of samadhi. This story is slightly different from the one from the Yoga Vashishta and the Trupira Rahasya. It's talking about uh, the direct experience through um, the moonlight, lit <laughs> summer night. And when that happened in that moment, it was so powerful for him. And since he's the seeker of the first category, and he attained it in that moment. And he realized that this is far greater than any pleasure, even in heaven. And so he realizes, why should he waste his time in his external life? With the food and the damsels and the court and the ornaments. And then he started hating some of these objects. But then he realizes, why should I hate anything? Everything is unreal. All things are unreal. And I'm just complete unto myself. And so his insight went even deeper that he is full of bliss. And whether he's in samadhi or not, he was fully enlightened and perfect. Such a person doesn't really hate anything nor is he attached to anything. It simply is. He has no sense of duty. He simply does what he is doing. The story from the Yoga Vashishta, for example, explains the same thing in a slightly different way. And it says, at first he thought he would just give up being a king and go retire in the forest. But then he thought, what difference does it make? I can also be here, right? And so he continues to remain a witness. And this is exactly what this version says as well. Just remain a witness. There is no need then to go anywhere if you are a witness. The need to go somewhere, to retire, to retreat, comes when one is still in this process of becoming. You don't need it when you have you are just being. You need to retire into the forest or retreat when you still have some scars to uncolor, learn to let go these in deep meditation. Then there is a need or a desire to withdraw from life and go to a quiet place. But once that process of uncoloring has really progressed to a very far and there's very little left to uncolor. What is left is in, the residue in fact is the self, the pure unalloyed self and there is not much of the samskaras left anymore. Then such a person is not going to go anywhere. He's not interested in running away anymore from life and he can also just live a life because he'll ask you, where shall I run? Where shall I go? Even in the Himalayas, in a cold cave, also you will have to face your thoughts. But once you have faced your thoughts and there are no samskaras, you have become desireless, then why would you want to stay in the cave? Then you can just go anywhere. It doesn't matter anymore. So we talk very briefly now about the third category of students and the second category. So the third category of seeker receives the fruits of his austerities in several lifetimes. And the second category of aspirant attains knowledge systematically, listening to the great adepts, contemplating on that knowledge they attain the state beyond. 
So there are three categories of seekers. The very first one being like Janaka himself, attaining spontaneously, becoming witnesses. The second category, those who acquire knowledge systematically, listen to great adepts and work on themselves in an intense manner so that in this lifetime itself they are able to receive some fruit of their austerities. And in the third category, the fruit of their sadhana, their efforts, is acquired only over several lifetimes, which means that their sadhana is not very intense, it's a very mild, and therefore it takes many, many lifetimes for them to live this out. Any questions or any thoughts so far? Well, in that case, we can stop here. We will continue then next Saturday with the Tripura Rahasya.